Hello, welcome to Kettering Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Michael Bodie, and here are some things that you should know about. First, Aaron Schust on February 23rd at 7 p.m. will be here in concert. Doors open at 6 p.m. and this is a free concert, so you want to make sure that you are here to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. Second, Bronze Fest is taking place Sunday, February 25th at 4 p.m. right here in the sanctuary at Kettering Church. Now, this is gonna be a very cool event. There are gonna be six bell choirs from all over, led by a conductor all the way from Paris. So you are not gonna to wanna to miss it. Make sure you are here in place Sunday, February 25th at 4 p.m. for Bronze Fest. Lastly, if you remember last year, we had agape feasts in people's homes. There was food, fellowship, prayer, and the Holy Spirit moved mightily. We are doing Agape Feast once again this year. If you are interested in helping host for Agape Feast, go to the welcome desk and sign up, or you can email Pastor Alex directly. My name is Michael Bodie, and this is Kettering Life. And uh, I'd like you to, right now, think about your favorite Winter Olympics. And then I would like you just to look over to a friend or to a neighbor there and tell them if you could win any gold medal in the Winter Olympics, what event would it be in? Take a minute. <laughs> I choose the bobsled. <laughs> yes, I want to be on the bobsled team. We're so happy that all of you are here. We're happy for those that are watching via live stream, and we pray that God will bless this morning. Would you stand and sing with us this morning? faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. Your girl. 
Darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope You have covered all my sin Sing, you are peace You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true Even in my wandering you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and your death has lost its sting. Yeah. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your life. Will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You are more. Cause you are more. You are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord. You are Lord. All creation. of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world forever reign my heart will sing no other name Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus, my heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. To your arms, 
I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You sing this with me. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus.
church. Now is the time for our community prayer. And if you have a burden on your heart or there's a victory that happened in your life that you wanna celebrate, I wanna welcome you um, down to the front here. This time is an intentional time to pray together, to wrap your arms around each other, um, and just thank God for the things that he's done in our life or to lift your burdens up to him. So as we continue studying the book of Acts, we're following the early church in its infant stages. They were renegades going against the grain of culture, tradition, and religion. They were a rebel movement spreading the gospel like wild, wildfire across the world. But that didn't come without setbacks or persecution. Today, as we start our new series called Advance, we start with the story of Stephen, a man who gave his life for the cause of Christ. This week, our nation has faced another terrible tragedy. If you've seen any news pieces, you'll most likely have seen some of the survivors talking about their experience. What is so inspiring to see is that through this grief, all these teenagers are rising up and saying enough is enough. And whether you agree or disagree with them, I think it's time to listen. Our world is broken and it needs Jesus. It needs to be told the good news of how life-changing Jesus is. As you walked into this space this morning, you may have noticed some artwork being portrayed in the back and on the screens and up here on the stage. I wanna take a minute to explain it. In this picture, the diverse crowd represents the gift of diversity that we are blessed with at this church. We have young people and old people, all of different ethnicities, families, married couples, singles, grandparents, you name it. We are breaking through walls and barriers to create a clear and uncluttered path to Jesus for others. As we, as we advance the kingdom of God into our families, our places of work, and our communities. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, let us be your vessels so the world may know you. I pray as we begin this series that you will bless the people in this room in a special way. Lord, you know the burdens on our hearts. Bring healing to those with health issues. Bring comfort to those who are grieving. Bring peace to those who are anxious about their future. As a church community, show us how to create an atmosphere where anyone can belong, a space that fosters community. May all we do be modeled after you, creating a clear and under, uncluttered path to experience you in a relevant and intentional way. Please be with Pastor Carl as he brings us his message. Speak through him this morning. Thank you for everything you've done and who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. legendary football coach at the Ohio State University is credited with coining the phrase three yards and a cloud of dust, referring to his offensive strategy in football, explaining that the best way to win football games is to just advance the ball down the field three yards at a time. Now, of course, it doesn't have the sizzle or the pizzazz of a triple reverse flea flicker or an 80-yard bomb down the field, but as Woody Hayes used to say, do you want to get applause or do you want to win games? And he won a lot of games with that philosophy. Three yards and a cloud of dust. Incremental, dogged, Progress. Just keep moving the football down the field three yards at a time. William Webb, the New Testament scholar, suggests that this is a helpful metaphor in thinking about God's involvement in the human story over the long arc of time. All the way back to the beginning of time on this earth, we can see God's kingdom is, in fact, advancing. 
He's moving the ball down the field three yards in a cloud of dust toward that ultimate end zone, of course, which would, re- which would be the earth made new. That is, God's loving rule, where it will rule for all of eternity. But in the meantime, he just keeps advancing his cause three yards at a time. You think back, give you an example of this, to the Pentateuch. One of the laws stated for God's people said, uh, you can beat your slave so long as your slave is able to stand under his or her own power two days later. And people read that and wonder, what kind of a barbaric God would tell his people that it's okay to beat their slaves? You have to understand always in the context, in the culture of the people in that day. Now, at the time, the rule was that you could beat your slave for any reason at all to death. And so it is into that context that God comes along and says, no, I want to move you toward the end zone, my loving rule, where my love will prevail for eternity. But we do it three yards at a time. So, yes, you can discipline your slaves, but there has to be some boundaries. You have to do it with mercy and compassion. So God is moving his people three yards at a time. You can read all through Scripture, and you see example after example of how God is, in fact, building his kingdom. A baby in Bethlehem, three yards and a cloud of dust. The stories, the miracles, the teachings, three yards at a time. The crucifixion, the resurrection, the establishment of the early church, three yards and a cloud of dust. Then, of course, resurrection morning, three yards. Then, Pentecost, the unveiling of the Holy Spirit in God's people. Again, he's building his kingdom. His church is advancing steadily down the field. And so we've been looking together through the book of Acts and noting how God is in fact building his kingdom and he continues to this day. Today, as was mentioned, we start a brand new series I'm really excited about simply called Advance. We will continue in our journey through the book of Acts noting how God is steadily advancing his kingdom. And we realize nothing will stop this God. Nothing. Not even persecution. Today we look at the world's first martyr for the cause of Christ. Acts chapter 6, if you have your Bible, or you maybe picked up the outline on your way in, go ahead and find Acts chapter 6. We meet Stephen in verse 5. He was one of the elders who was tasked with addressing the squabble between the Hebraic and the Hellenistic Jews as they were caring for the widows and the orphans. Again, as we see the church reaching out to the marginalized, we see God is at work, advancing his kingdom, three yards and a cloud of dust. And Stephen is a part of this deacon team. But now in verse 8, notice how he is described. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Just a quick word about Stephen. His name in the Greek literally means a crown. This could be taken one of two ways. Could be referring to the earthly crown, great power and so on, or the crown of thorns. Opposition arose from members of the synagogue, we read, of the free men, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they, referring to these Jews, could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave to Stephen as he spoke. Because, again, nothing can stop the advancement of God's kingdom. 
And so they had no counter for Stephen and for the Spirit. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. You see what's happening here, right? The Jews are fabricating stories against Stephen. This whole idea of fake news, it's nothing new. It's as old as the story of Stephen. They're making up these stories. So, they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses, that is, fake news reporters, who testified this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like that of the face of an angel. Brings to mind, have you seen the Shell credit card commercials? where apparently if you sign up for this Shell credit card, you immediately gain gold status. And so in the commercial, you have somebody who just signed up for a Shell credit card, and they're glowing gold, like the aura of an angel. This is what Stephen looked like, I imagine. He had the face of an angel. Ellen White explains, light shone into the minds of many who afterward gladly followed its rays. The truths spoken on this occasion were destined to shake nations and to live through all time, influencing the hearts of men when the lips that had uttered them should be silent in a martyr's grave. You would think the lips would be silent in a martyr's grave, but she says, no. Him glowing like an angel changed people, changed the destiny of nations. Again, nothing is going to stop this kingdom that God is establishing. Now, what follows in verses 2 to 53 is this amazing sermon. So, your homework for this afternoon is to read through this sermon in its entirety, okay? Would you do that? Go back and read through the story. It's amazing. It just keeps building. And Stephen starts talking about the history of God's people. Tracing God at work. Three yards and a cloud of dust. He mentions the story of Abraham. Three yards and a cloud of dust. And then Joseph. Three yards and a cloud of dust. Then Moses. Three yards and a cloud of dust. It builds And it builds until we get this climactic ending in verse 51. Listen to what Stephen is preaching now. I mean, he is on a roll. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. That's harsh language, isn't it? You imagine if I preached like that. You're a bunch of murderers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Then he says, you have received the law. In other words, of all people, you have received the law that was given through angels, but you have not obeyed it. No wonder people felt really uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable, hard sermon to hear talking with a friend of mine the other day when he was telling me about growing up in a very conservative Adventist church in a country in the communist bloc in Eastern Europe. He was saying how sometimes preachers would share these sermons that just had everybody squirming uncomfortably. Like, for example, he said when they were launching a capital campaign to build a new building, They locked the doors in the back of the sanctuary, and the preacher said, nobody's leaving until we get a major pledge from everybody. 
And then they had to raise their hand, stand up and say, okay, I pledge so much money toward this. And if the pastor felt like, no, that's not enough, he would just say that. Oh, yeah. Mr. Brown, sit down, stand back up, and double your pledge. We think you can do more than that. And then if there was somebody who was trying not to give a pledge, they just wouldn't get out of church. The sermon would never be over until so-and-so finally stood up and said, okay, I'll give X and X, you know, so much money toward this cause. I think that would make you feel a little uncomfortable if we started to do that for our capital campaign, right? Well, multiply that uncomfortable feeling exponentially. You get, begin to get a sense of what people were feeling as they listened to Stephen's sermon. Bible scholar Ajish Ferdinand says, this sermon that Stephen preached should cause sober reflection. This is especially so since the history of the church has so many instances of Christians being out of step with what God is doing. You know, God is advancing his kingdom. Unfortunately, says this man, too often God's people are not in step with him. And then he cites a number of examples from history where the church has not been in step three yards in a cloud of dust with God. For example, he says, when Hitler began his radical nationalistic program, many Christians joined him. Moreover, many not only in Germany, but also throughout the world kept quiet when they heard about the atrocities being committed against the Jews. I think a major reason for this scandalous record within the church is that Christians often want to be comfortable. Thus, they resist change. Christianity, however, can never coexist with comfort. Our comfort has never been God's top priority. Even when uncomfortable truth is spoken, as is the case in this story, God challenges us. And when members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Now often, as I think about this story, I venerate Stephen, of course. He was the world's first martyr who died for the cause of Christ. But I read this story through different eyes this week as I just recently watched a movie that my daughter at Walla Walla University recommended. She's been taking a course in uh, gender equality and film. And she said, Dad, you've got to watch one of these movies that we had to watch called The Stoning of Soraya M. Anybody seen that movie? It is extremely disturbing. True story. French journalist. Car broke down in Iran. And so he was stranded for the day in a small Iranian village. It was there he discovered that just the day before, there had been a stoning in that town. The reason? The man got tired of this woman, his wife. He wanted to get married to his mistress. And so he fabricated some fake news about her and they stoned her to death. I'm telling you, when it got to the point where they started to throw stones at this woman, I looked away and then... I had to pull out my earphones. I was watching it on my iPad. I couldn't even listen. It was so horrific. So as I'm reading this story of Stephen, 
that came to mind, just how horrific this really was. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul is observing all of this. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Very similar to the crucifixion of Jesus, isn't it? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And still, in spite of this horrific scene, even though we see persecution nothing will thwart the advancement of God's kingdom. You can't stop God's kingdom from moving forward. How exactly did his death advance the cause of God three yards and a cloud of smoke down the field? Ellen White answers, the martyrdom of Stephen made a deep impression upon all who witnessed it. His death resulted in the conviction of Saul, who could not efface from his memory the faith and constancy of the martyr and the glory that had rested on his countenance. Stephen's conviction in that moment led to Saul's conversion. You can't stop the kingdom of God. Even persecution, even the stoning of Stephen just advances the cause, moves the mission down the field. Because what could rulers and authorities do? Pliny, the Roman governor, questioned, how can we stop these Christ followers? He wrote a famous letter to the Roman emperor, Trajan, wondering, how do we stop these Christians? And he told specifically about one Christ follower who was on the stand testifying. And so they interrogated him with questions. And Pliny said, I will banish you. The Christian replied, you cannot, for all the world is my father's house. Then I will kill you, said the governor. You cannot, answered the Christian. For my life is hid in Christ. Well, then I will take away all of your possessions, continued Pliny. You cannot. My treasure is in heaven. Then I will drive you away from man, and you will have no friends left, was the final threat. And again, the calm reply, you cannot, for I have an unseen friend from whom you can never separate me. I mean, what is a poor, harassed Roman governor to do, even though at his disposal are the powers of life and death and torture and the stake But there's nothing he can do to these committed followers of Christ. Because, see, the church of Jesus Christ will ultimately prevail. He is on a mission, this God of ours. And nothing, nothing can stop it. Back to Woody Hayes. Another story of his that I love Of course, before he got the gig at Ohio State University, he was a very successful coach, smaller universities here in the state of Ohio. But when he got to Ohio State, he knew now he had arrived in the big leagues. This made him very nervous. He remembered the first time he walked out into the middle of the field and looked around 86,000 empty seats. He started trembling. He was holding the hand of his little boy on the 50-yard line. His boy recognized that his dad's hand was all sweaty and 
shaking because he was so nervous. When the boy said, but daddy, the football field is still the same size. It's all relative. You don't need to be intimidated. You just got to remember, Daddy, football field, it's still the same size. Friends, may I remind all of us, no matter what it is you're facing these days, no matter how intimidated you may feel right now, May I remind you, our God is still the same size as he was when he created the universe. Our God is still the same size as he was when he led his people out of Egypt. Our God is still the same size as he was when he took down the giant Goliath. Our God is still the same size as he was when he delivered Daniel out of the lion's den. Our God is still the same size as he was when he toppled the walls of Jericho. Our God is still the same size as he was when he healed Naaman of his leprosy. Our God is still the same size as he was when he fed thousands of people with one little lunch. Our God is still the same size as he was when he called his buddy Lazarus out of the grave. And our God is still the same size as he was when he exploded out of that tomb on Easter morning. We don't need to be intimidated. God's kingdom will prevail. His people will triumph. Nothing, nothing can stop the advancement of God's mission, his cause, his kingdom. We don't need to be afraid, for we are marching to Zion, to that end zone, three yards at a time, three yards in a cloud of smoke. We are marching to Zion, and nothing, nothing can stop our great God. I invite you guys to stand with me and sing this familiar song. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, thus around the throne. Sing it. Swim marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, children of the heavenly King, will speak their joys abroad, speak their joys abroad. We're marching. Swim marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city. Then let our songs abide and every tear be dry. Ground. 
We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful Marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. For our benediction, I will simply read you the tweet this week, which is the teaching in 280 characters or less and let the record show we are letting you out plenty early you have time to do two things meet somebody that you've never met before on your way to sabbath school and number two retweet our benediction <laughs> our god is the same god who created the universe fed the masses healed the sick walked on water and stormed out of his grave no worries he has slain bigger giants than you face. He has solved bigger problems than you know. God's gospel is on the move. His kingdom will prevail and his people will triumph. Amen. <laughs>